Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Flavor always wins. What's the role of chefs in the regenerative transition and why did this chef start a seed company and he feels pretty optimistic about the future of the food system? Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash egg or find the link below. Thank you. So welcome to another episode today with chef and co-owner of Blue Hill in Manhattan, New York and Blue Hill at Stone Barns, plus the co-founder of Row 7 Seeds. Welcome chef Dan Barber. Thank you. Nice to be here. And to start with a personal, I mean, you've shared it before, but I'm wondering if there is more to that story when you saw the potential of regenerative agriculture, where soil came really into you, into your life? Was it a moment or was that more like a longer, slowly evolving journey? There is a moment that that was a kind of before and after moment. I think the thing that came to mind is that I was standing at a at a farm in upstate New York, run by owned and run by a man named Klaus Martins. And Klaus had been supplying me with wheat for many years that we ground, we, we milled into bread, into flour for bread. And it was extraordinary. We made bread that I, I, I had become quite well known for. And I had set out to write a book about farm to table cooking. And I really was starting the book with the extraordinary wheat that I milled from Klaus's uh, growing practices. And so, I decided to end up visiting him and learning the recipe for why his wheat was so spectacular. And I arrived and stood in the middle of the field and it took about, I don't know, 30 seconds for me to realize that of the 2,000 acres of his farm, uh, very little of it was actually in wheat. I saw saw some beautiful wheat growing, but I also saw tons of other crops, rye and buckwheat and millet and barley and and they were all timed to this meticulous rotation, a meticulously timed rotation that provided soil fertility for his major crops, one of which being wheat, another being corn. But the, the image was just so immediate for me. It was like I was being touted as a, a sort of leading farm to table chef. And here I was only supporting a tiny slice of the farm and What I learned is that all these other crops that Klaus was growing that I mentioned and the dozens of others that I saw and learned about that day were there to provide the fertility, the diversity, and ultimately the fertility that allowed for the wheat crop to be so successful. And tasty. Yeah. Well, successful in my world was really tasty, but yes, the the fertility allowed the wheat to express those flavors that were so extraordinary, but I wasn't supporting the whole farm. I you know, wasn't supporting the health of the soil. I was supporting the king crop, the wheat crop, which, you know, I was embarrassed about. So I went back and I really changed my entire cooking, not so much philosophy, but I deepened how I thought about my cooking and how my menu should set out to support the whole farm. We talk about nose to tail of an animal, we really talk about the nose to tail of an entire farm. And that was the lesson of my, of my time with Klaus and, and a deepening understanding of what it means to be organic, which is an organism. And in the context of deliciousness, which I think is 
truly rooted in soil, and I know it is from my experience, what enables that to happen is a farmer who is practicing the kind of diversity that allows fertility to thrive and gives you a crop like the wheat that I was tasting. The irony is that, and it's not a nice irony, is that Klaus's other crops, the dozens or so other crops that he was growing to get that fertility, you know, he didn't really have a market for. It. So the rye and the buckwheat and the barley were mostly thrown into bag feed for animals, for which Klaus made, you know, pennies on the dollar and made his money on the wheat. So it's also a lesson in not just supporting the whole farm, but in why organic agriculture is so expensive. Because the one cash crop has to cover for everything. Yeah, it's the cash crop has to cover everybody else, <laughs> all the other crops that nobody wants to eat. And then that got me, and that's what got me to really change my book. And I, I ended up writing a book called The Third Plate about the whole farm because it because you can't be sustainable without a diet that supports the entirety of it. And that, you know, and then I then you end up realizing that cuisines, the history of cuisines is just about that. It's about a pattern of eating that is rooted in diversity that gives you soil health, that gives you flavors and, and diversity that is to be celebrated. So that's the lesson that I came away with from. And you created, and I'll definitely link the, the book below in the show notes, and you created your famous uh, rotation risotto. Yeah. And yeah. did you see that being taken by other chefs? Do you see that as a role of chefs to rediscover that, what we have done based on the landscape, what a landscape can provide, which is changing over time now as, as we have changed the landscapes quite dramatically? Do you see that as your role and, and potentially other roles of other the roles of other chefs in this, let's say, regenerative transition? I think it's the role of all chefs, yeah, is to support what is truly regenerative. That's kind of the point of good cooking, you know, and it gets lost on us sometimes. I, I think it's being rediscovered. I, I, Has it changed in that moment, since that moment in that field, which is, I don't know, eight, ten years ago, maybe? Have you seen shifts around you for the good and the bad? Yeah, I've, the, what I've seen is the culture of food changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Sure. I mean, look, when I started Blue Hill, you had to have certain things on the menu. You know, the men, in many ways, you didn't have a lot of choice if you wanted to be a high-end restaurant. Today, the definition of a high-end restaurant is to celebrate those crops that are grown locally. Actually, even more than that, the best restaurants in the world now are about a menu that is filled with ingredients that you can't get anywhere else. And what the definition of that is hyper local. I mean, you're, you know, that's that the whole shift in food cultures and has enabled or and led by chefs has been about distinctiveness of place. And that's about ecology. And that's about celebrating your environment in a way that can be expressed through crops and you know, cooking is celebrating that. So that's a very positive development. And it's a rarefied part of the of the food culture because it's white tablecloth restaurants. Yeah, do you see it getting out of the restaurant as well? Do you, is it, has it been, or if not, how can we make sure it goes beyond that table where we eat amazingly, we celebrate it, but then it's Saturday evening and then on Monday we do something completely else. How do we get it to the, the kitchen of of the daily the daily life? Yeah, well, I mean, I do think that that happens. Uh, I do think you you bleed into the everyday food culture. It just happens slowly, you know, and unfortunately, as you just mentioned at the top of this hour, we don't have a lot of time here. We have to move this along in a way. I, I think chefs play a big role in it because chefs pursue flavor and true flavor really only comes from good soil. That's end of story. Do you see that? Because I see a lot of people, especially at technology conferences or, or even in general that throw at me, but why don't we just grow everything in vertical farms? I see the efficiency or let's get in some GMOs or some lab grown meat. And I'm looking, I'm not looking for an answer there because it's, that's a whole different discussion. But what do you say to people when they throw that on the table, basically to you, like why bother with soil so much? Why bother with soil so much is again, I'm, uh, my shiv is flavor. And so I know that you can only get that the people who argue that you can get that from hydroponics or from multi-story growing facilities are quite wrong. And what I've discovered is that there's so much to discover. This idea that we actually know what's happening in soil or that, you know, what's to be learned about soil, soil health and the potential for human health and flavor is, is something that our great-grandparents did. It's preposterous. It's, it's laughable. We know so little. 
What is the latest thing you discovered about soil that really surprised you? I've just been talking to a plant breeder, a corn breeder, who has been breeding a type of corn that fixes nitrogen on its own. Wow. There is a wild variety of corn in Mexico that was discovered many years ago that has this ability. But he's been breeding for it. So he's been taking those genetics and actually selecting for it. So he's got a corn plant that, I mean, this is revolutionary. You just have to take you through it. I mean, I think you understand, but I just want to make sure everyone who's listening understands it. Walk us through it. Yeah. yeah. Well, just in America, we have 180 million acres of corn and soybean rotation. 100% of those rotations are based on fertilizers. Of those fertilizers, 70% of that accounts for nitrogen, which is injected into the soil in a chemical form to make the plant grow faster and more robust. The consequences of that on carbon release into the atmosphere, on polluting water, on asphyxiation in waterways all the way down to Mexico and the Gulf of Mexico is extraordinary. The effects on bird life, I mean, on and on. You know, it's hard to pinpoint one reason for a catastrophe. It's so vast. The amount of acres is just, and the amount of applied stuff. The amount of damage is extraordinary. And there's a lot of reasons for it. But it's hard to not argue that nitrogen addition to crops isn't in the top one or two. (laughs) And when you talk about corn, you're really talking about the two evils, this monoculture of corn and nitrogen. So that's the background. And here we are with a breeder no one's ever heard of in the middle of the country who's breeding a corn variety that fixes its own nitrogen. It doesn't need any nitrogen. So he's showing me a picture of his corn grown organically without any additions, but very healthy soil. So he's done all the rotations to lock, like that farmer Klaus did when I was watching in the field, to lock and load the soil with the kind of fertility that can really give corn its boost. But also the corn fixes its own nitrogen and he was growing it next to a literally uh, 15 feet away from corn plants that were fed the requisite amount of nitrogen. And his growth was almost exactly the same as the nitrogen additions. And the taste, or you, or you didn't taste Well, I ha- I'm taste, I'm interested you say that because I'm, I cannot wait for the, the harvest, which is coming uh, in three weeks. And this is a feed corn, but I still am excited, a very excited to taste it. But the reason I'm telling you all this, it, because we started by saying, you know, we know nothing about soil. And the reason I'm saying that is because what he has discovered himself is fascinating. What he was explaining is that it's not that you're simply selecting a corn plant that can fix its own nitrogen, because that in and of itself is a revolution, okay? That in and of itself, if we had the mindset, the techno guys that you were talking to at your conferences, if you could explain them just the biological opportunity of that is so extraordinary and so exciting that in and of itself, it's like, you know, Jeff Bezos going to space. That's a whole thing. But let me tell you what I really got excited about. What I really got excited about is the only way the corn fixes nitrogen from the air naturally is because of soil biology. And what he's discovered is that at the rhizosphere, which is where the root system is in the soil, there is, through this corn plant, an injection, literally an injection of bacteria. And he's watched it on film where it comes out of the roots of the corn plant into the soil community, microbial community. And what he's saying is that, look, this plant will literally feed like a sugar syrup into the soil, but you have to have the right community. To reply. To reply back. So it's a coalescing of what is literally ejected from the corn plant into this rhizosphere. The biological community is eating each other. They're cohabitating and that environment needs to be correct because otherwise the plant won't, it won't go back up into the plant. So, right. So he's saying, yes, it's all, yes, this plant is amazing, but actually it's only amazing because of the soil and what the potential to, and this opens up this whole other area of investigation, which is what is the biological potential of a soil community that is truly healthy? Well, we no, nobody's doing that. Nobody's doing that. What's the taste potential or the biomass potential of a landscape? Yeah. Well, that's, so that's, okay. So that's what I'm getting at is, and what I wanted to show you a picture of was the corn uh, fed to chickens 
from this natural fixation. And what you would see is a picture of a yolk that is so orange, it looks like the setting sun, uh, you know, at seven o'clock in Hawaii. It is so bright. I've never seen anything like it. And that's... You almost think it's fake. Like somebody played with it. I thought it was fake. He showed me all these pictures of it and I could not believe it. And, you know, now not to get too philosophical about it, but it's like... Please do. But what it gets you to, you have to get philosophical because it's so... You have to be reverent. Because it's life. It's Yeah. It's kind of what this goes to. It's like when you talk to techno guys, what is always missing is just a reverence. Because technological driven anything, and especially agriculture, is actually compared to what I just described, is so simplistic. It is so A to B. Like what excites me about talking to this guy and many other even soil scientists that I talk to is if they all come back to the reference, it's because they don't know what's going on. They really don't. Like, no, they, they just like, this has not been studied near enough. We spend our money going up to space and we don't spend our money going down. We know more about the soil on Mar Mars than we know about our own, yeah. Right, and the reference is the sense of like, this is the most complex biology imaginable and we don't have a, a language to excite people about biology. We have a language to excite people about technology because that's, you know, that's the Steve Jobs. We do, it's a language of taste, it's a language of flavor. Well, but I, that would be my argument, is that the only way to get people to be excited about biology is to taste it, because I think you can. I think when the biology's right, and here's the reverence part. And we're starting to measuring it, and you're doing that with Joe Clepperton, and I mean, they're starting to come, the technology piece is coming, in this case, to help, <laughs> to measure the nutrients, yeah. Right, and I think what it ends up being is a gift. That flavor is a gift. And then what the chicken is saying, or the egg is saying to you is, you've grown that corn correctly, and I'm now going to reward you with an egg that's going to blow your mind. And then you get a flavor like that, and it becomes revelatory. And that soil talking to you, it just speaks in a language through that kind of flavor. And obviously the health benefits, you look at the egg, it's like you look healthy. I mean, you feel healthier just looking at it, you know, it's not like, you know what I mean? It's like, there's so much beta carotene running through that thing. It probably sets you up for life. So to me, it's just, it's so exciting. It's so exciting. I get so frustrated. It's because we know so little. And yet when you try and explain this to people, it's like biology It's like, it's so complex and it's inefficient because look, to feed the biological community is inefficient. It takes a lot. We A, we don't know a lot, but B, what we do know is that you can't grow one thing of one variety over and over again. Technology allows you to do that. So all of a sudden you're just frustrated and the response back is, well, we have a population that's one third hungry and, and a population that's exploding and don't you wanna feed people and you know, oh God. So anyway, you get all tripped up with that stuff. But And so if we're in that phase of knowing so little, which is extremely exciting, I think, and we're in the first innings of this discovery process, what would you tell to entrepreneurs listening, but also investors listening that are excited, that read your book, read other books, have visited farms and are ready to invest or ready to work in the space? Like where should they, without giving investment advice, obviously, but where should they focus? Where should they get to work if they're not a chef? You don't want investment advice from me, but I would say that if you are an investor and you're looking at the ag space, your horizon should not be on five-year horizons. Your horizon should be on 20 and 30 years. And if your horizon on 20 and 30 years, I bet with biology every time. There's no question in my mind that as we go down this road of technology, of replacing the cow with impossible burgers and doing all the hydroponics that we're doing, we are going to discover that the health consequences of this are extraordinary. And there is going to be a rush back to real food and we need to be ready. And if you're ready, if you're an investor, you are going to do quite well at the end of the game. I think it's a lot, you know, it reminds me of when I was growing up, I just thought of this. I, when I was growing up, um, you know, everyone was eating margarine. I don't know if you're old enough to buy me margarine. In the Netherlands, it was a thing. Yeah, Unilever became quite big with this stuff. In the US, to eat butter in the 70s was like laughable. It was like, well, we've, you know, scientists have discovered Fat is bad. Yeah. Something that's fat's bad and that can be so much more healthy and, you know, is a fine substitute for butter. And that there's this woman, Joan Gussow, who's a, one of my favorite nutritionist scholars. And she has this quote that says, I never switched to margarine because I always trusted cows more than scientists. 
That's what I would, if I was an investor, that's what I would look at. I would look at biological systems and the health of animals and humans as much more trustworthy than what science can do, technological science anyway can do. And that's not specific advice for an investor, but that would be my overall. It's a direction, yeah. And and what do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture? You've been in this space for quite a bit and regenerative food systems that others don't. So where are you contrarian? And this definitely comes from John Kemp. My contrarian aspect of it is that I bristle at what is being called regenerative because it is always about doing less damage to the earth and to the environment, to soil health. Always less. It's we are a regenerative farm because we're using 40% less nitrogen fertilizer. We are a regenerative farm because we cut down pesticides by 80%. We are a regenerative farm because our water use is now 50% of what it was 10 years ago. Those are always the data points. We're less bad than we were 10 years ago. And to be regenerative, the true definition of it. If there is one. If there is. Uh, well, I think we should say there is. And, and truly to regenerate is to make something better. And we don't know how good looks like actually, or how better looks like. We know how better looks like. We don't know where it goes, Yeah, where it ends. Well, we don't think of agriculture in terms of improving ecological functioning, ecological systems in the environment. We look at it always in let's do less damage. And if you want to improve an environment, then you go to wild, you go to, to protected space. Uh, I mean, that's the American experience. We built the national parks. That was to say... Big fence. And, yeah. To, yeah, we're going to put a fence around it and... Move everybody who was in it by chance. Yeah. Right. If you want to visit that, you can experience what real nature is. Otherwise, you can shit all over the earth otherwise. And, you know, as long as we have these protected spaces. But what if we thought about agriculture really in an indigenous context, which is why history, agriculture history is so important, because in that context... You think about systems that were in place that improved the environment for where food was grown. And that is not only possible, it's absolutely necessary to feed the world in the future. So regenerative, if you're truly regenerative, you are leaving your farmland in better condition every year than you had it the year before. And that I do think that's possible. And for your neighbors and for your children and for whoever you're passing the farm on, that should be the responsibility of agriculture. And that kind of ethic is not in the American ethic of growing food. And you mentioned uh, asking financial advice from you probably is not a good idea, but let's say overnight you, you're no longer a chef, but you become in charge of a quite a large fund, let's say a billion dollars. Maybe I have to increase it to 10 billion now because of inflation and, and billions are fly, flying around. But let's say you have a lot of resources. What would you invest in? What would you prioritize? I'm not asking to the dollar amount, but what would you prioritize in terms of investments? And it can be a very long-term fund. Yeah, grass-fed beef, probably. I mean, if you're going for the big dog in America, I'd go for grass-fed beef or grass-fed milk. Because the, the environmental impact on grain-fed meat and grain-fed cows for milk is so extraordinary. We just talked about 100 million, 80 million acres of corn and soybeans. 75% of that's going to feed a cow. And even the breeder you just mentioned is growing feed for cows. It's not, I mean, you're going to eat it, right. you're going to use it, but it, right. you're going to be very small in his, in his rotation, unfortunately. That's very right. That's very right. And if you could change one thing overnight in the global food system, honestly, you have a magic wand and you no longer are in charge of your fund, unfortunately. But if you could change one thing overnight, what would that be? In the global food system, if I could change one... Could be American specifically if you wanted as well. No, no. It's, I would, so one thing is I would relocalize everything. That's where the best food comes from. I'm still a chef when you give me that example. So if I'm still a chef, I'm still after the best flavor. And the best flavor comes from micro regions. And so if I have a wand that I can wave, it would be to reinvigorate the localized food economies of the world, which, you know, today they're still there. It's not like I'm talking about 50 years ago. I mean, today, 90% of food grown in the world is grown on five acres or less. We do not yet have the westernized conception of how food is grown. We are exporting that idea to the rest of the world and it's a disaster, but it's not too late. It's really not. I'm not saying that to be positive because I, there's not a lot positive to say about industrial, about, you know, the state of agriculture these days, but it is to say the reality is, you know, we're still, we are at an inflection point and there is still a road to take that could be a lot more beneficial to the environment, to our health and to the pleasure of eating. And what's the role of seeds just to wrap up? You started the seed company 
Um, I've eaten the pumpkin actually once, but oh, yeah? okay. I haven't followed it too closely. Where are you now and what's exciting on the seed part, apart from the corn part, which is super exciting, anything else beyond that? Yeah, we're work I'm having conversations with breeders like the guy I was just talking about who are looking at selecting seeds for flavor and for nutrient density. And it turns out that when you select seeds for flavor, you are automatically selecting seeds that give you great health potential, nutrient density, and most often are beneficial to the soil microbial community. Uh, it's very interesting, those three things. I mean, when do we ever have the opportunity to strike you know, a, a bullseye with one thing in three, strike three things in one stroke? And seeds is an opportunity really to improve the pleasure of food the nutrition of food and the environment all in one little seed. And that's why I really started the company was the potential of it. Today, nearly 65% of the future of our food supply, which is seeds, is in the hands of four companies. Four. 50 years ago, there were 10,000 companies and most seeds were traded. They were not sold. Today, four companies over 60, it's between 60 and 65%. That's depressing. I want to add one more level of depression. The four companies that own nearly 65% of our food supply are all chemical companies. They are not seed companies. They own seed, they own seed companies. They own multiple seed companies, but their overarching company is chemical companies and is a, is a chemical company, is a multinational chemical company. So that means that they are selecting and breeding seeds that are meant for a chemical intervention a pesticide or a fertilizer or an herbicide. And definitely not something that takes nitrogen out of the air by itself. Why? They wouldn't make money. They wouldn't make money. So they make their money with the intervention. And that, if I was an investor, I'd get the hell away from that because that's not going to last. And do you see that uh, since you started, have you seen any other signs? I want to end on a high note. <laughs> do you see, or on a not the super depressing note. You've been working on this for a while. Have you seen any other small early signs? Just as I, I mean, we... You start looking at soil and you see things. Have you seen the same excitement starting in seeds? Yeah, I do. Yeah, people like you. People like you who are asking these kind of questions. I do. I see a lot of people asking these kind of questions of, this is not right. We're not headed in the right direction. And are we forgetting the wisdom of the past and marrying that wisdom with potential technologies that can truly bring us uh, more delicious and nutritious food? It's very possible. It's there. And so people like you, people like scientists like Jill Clapperton, there are breeders who I, I'm talking to almost every day who are out there coming out of the woodwork. So there is a definite, and then there's young people. There's young people in America anyway. I don't know as much about the rest of the world, but in America, there is just a swelling of interest, enthusiasm, and a refugia. They're the refugia movement. They will not take food from uh, highly processed food companies. There's a, re a wholesale rejection of it, actually. And when you talk to these food company executives, which I do, you hear from them very clearly say. Yeah, we had, we had Nestle on that clearly was scared because they saw scared. people changing, literally changing in the last two years, their buying habit, habits. It's everywhere. And all of them are saying, if we're going to be in business in 10 years, we need to really change course. And the system is not built to change course quickly. So it's going to be very challenging, but I think the groundswell of attention that's happening is happening because uh, on younger people, and I think it's being driven by pleasure and taste. It's not just people wanting to save the environment, because I don't think at the end of the day that drives enough people. It's enough. No, it's not. It's the pleasure that you get from really good food, and people are willing to spend a little more for it, but unwilling to support the companies that don't support that. And I, if I were an investor... Just from a brand perspective, I would not be in heavily investing in a company that is not focused on that next generation. Because once this generation that I'm talking about has kids, forget it. I mean, you think it's bad. You think it's interesting now. It'll be really interesting when they have kids. Because once you have kids, you, you're so conscious of what you're eating and what they're eating. And uh, it's another ball game. So I do actually, you know, I'm pretty cynical about everything. I'm pretty, I, I feel very positive about the future of where food could go. I, I, to your point, I hope it happens quickly enough. Thank you so much. I know you need to run. I will wrap up. Thank you, man. Thanks for your good work. Great questions. Thank you so much. And good luck with the seeds and everything else. 
If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash investingregionag or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale and the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations um, institutional capital banks insurance companies etc is this course free no this is pay what you think it's worth meaning i have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you and i'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast um, we have people with very different means so i'm inviting you if this course is creating value to you and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.